I'm Joanna Burton. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer here at ID5. It's now time for us to hear the perspectives of publishers from the US. We've already heard today from publishers in Europe and from many other experts um, during the course of the day. And throughout this year, throughout 2020, many US publishers have implemented Universal ID from ID5. And I'm really pleased to bring you this illustrious panel of experts that we have today who can share their thoughts on the, on the issue of the day, Identity 2021. So let's start with introductions. Please could each of you um, give a little introduction about yourself and say something about your business, bearing in mind we have a global audience today, and then also your role within that. And let's start with ladies first, please. Hi, I'm Sarah Badler. Um, I am the Senior Vice President of Programmatic Strategy um, and Revenue at Dot Dash. Um, in terms of my role, I definitely I oversee our open revenue um, product, revenue product operations, and all of our direct programmatic deals. So glad to be here and excited, um, yeah, to talk about identity. Great, Nathan. Sure, I'm Nathan Thomas, SVP Product and Innovation at Playwire. Uh, Playwire is a company that helps publishers monetize their content and basically to make their lives easier. Uh, we call it RAMP, Revenue Amplification Managed by Professionals, and that's what we believe we are. Um, and we just want publishers to be able to sit back, do what they do best, and we'll handle the monetary side of things. And which kind of publishers do you have? We have a whole sorts of publishers from small to large um, and in ver various verticals. It could be uh, in kids where we're more in the COPA space uh, or it can be in entertainment and gaming. That's where we typically historically came from. Great. And last but not least, Jeff. Hey, uh, my name is Jeff Sutton. I'm the VP of Programmatic and Ad Tech Revenue Strategy for a company called Advanced Local. Uh, we're a New York-based news and information publisher. We have a dozen sites around the country, roughly 50 million monthly unique visitors, give or take, depending on what's going on in the news. Hmm. And, um, and my job is fundamentally to figure out how to drive ROI on the content that we produce. Excellent. Thank you. Well, in the context of digital advertising, let me ask each of you, and especially around programmatic advertising, how important is it that you can recognize, that you can identify the, the individuals that visit your site or visit your publisher's sites? Um, Nathan, if we can start with you. Sure. Um, I mean, first and foremost, I would like to say that, you know, Playwire has always been about first party data. Um, you know, third party data is so commoditized, it doesn't even really have a value in the market anymore. Everyone's got the same. Is it accurate? Who knows? Uh, so over many years, we really have been building our own first party data and a lot of that also being non cookie based. Right. So I mentioned that we have uh, a lot of gaming publishers and we can use information on what games a publisher is playing, uh, a user is playing, I should say what hardware they have and all that, and really kind of uh, get close to an identity. Um, besides that, obviously, we do have a standard DMP as well, and we kind of funnel in a whole bunch of signals from the content that is being consumed on our websites. And we put that all together, and it really enables us to, one, maximize the value on our publishers, uh, and two, really help our advertisers reach who they want to reach at the right time, at the right place. Um, you know, I think that is much more valuable for us than, like I said, third party, and we're continuing down that path and obviously excited to work in with companies like ID5 that help us do that. Fantastic. And, uh, yeah, it sounds like you are pretty ahead of the curve. And what about you, Jeff? Yeah. So up until recently, we haven't seen any incremental value in first party data over third party data. You know, when you think about what a news and information site is about, you know, we cover local news, breaking news, trending news, sports, um, lifestyle and culture. Uh, we do some advocacy work. And none of that really gives strong signals to buyers as to what our readers really care about. Um, really, they're there because of the news, not because of any kind of consumer behavior that is attributable and then uh, marketable. 
But we see that really changing. Um, we were early adopters with the DMP. We made a pretty significant investment in understanding our readers at the most basic first party level, typically around GOIP. Um, and then we would append third party data and either use it for direct sales or make it available on a programmatic channel. Um, but I think the whole ecosystem is breaking. Um, we see that the cookie business has gotten extremely kind of bizarre. I'm looking at a pull out of our DMP that show that there are currently 500 and 1 million people who are, are devices or cookies on devices who are interested in cruises at this point in time. Um, that something like 764 million are planning um, vacation travel. Um, <laughs> those numbers are so preposterous given the circumstance that we're in that mm. it's difficult to make a credible claim to having anything that's valuable to a, a advertiser if the numbers are so distorted. So thanks to work that IE5 is doing as well as some others, we're finding that moving to an identity forward approach to understanding our audience is a critical change for us to make in 2021 as we prepare for 2022. Okay, fantastic. And, and, and Sarah, if I could ask you the same question, is it, or how important is it, and is it important indeed for you to recognize each visitor individually? It's not for us as much to do as it is for our marketers. Um, we are, uh, Dodash is unique in the sense that we're a search company, we're a search engine. 85% um, of our traffic is search. Um, we, you know, have made about nine acquisitions over the last 18 months. So we've been two as of two weeks ago. So we've been slowly um, acquiring and trying to figure out and replatforming. Um, when our users come to our site, they're looking for something specific it's totally intent based. They're not looking necessarily for, you know, what's in the news today or what's going to happen tomorrow. It's more, what do I do if my baby is teething and she won't go to sleep? Um, so for that person, that content and intent is extremely important for us. The biggest challenge that we're going to face, I think, with, you know, the future of our ecosystem is how can the marketers measure the success of knowing that that person is on the site? Um, and that's where we are kind of like, I don't want to say at a crossroads, but we need to figure out in terms of how we can scale it for the marketers to know that they're in the right place at the right time, which is our entire goal. Um, and then, and then what, of course, like a long-term strategy of how to do that. Um, we don't necessarily like in terms of first party or third party, obviously both um, relevant depending on the marketer and how they kind of figure that out. For us, what we're trying to do is essentially show how important and significant our intent is. Okay. And you have um, quite a, a large audience around the world, right? So do you see any differences in different markets? Is it more important in some or? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we are funny in the sense that we see behaviors, right? So like when there was a Super Bowl in the US, I think everyone Googled <laughs> Rem remedies of hangovers on Monday and probably ended up on some of our websites um, mm -hmm. where we wouldn't see that as much in the UK um, or Italy and so forth. Um, but to your point, we are global and have massive amounts of traffic um, in Europe. And as we've looked at rolling out a CMP and things like that, which we are still in the process of doing, I would say we're one of the leader publishers. It's more because we're kind of like, let's wait and see. And instead of, um, jumping the gun all in and something we're trying to kind of figure that out and to your point like it is different and it does vary per market and as we get closer into ccpa and some other things it'll vary in the us within states so we definitely see behavioral changes for sure and obviously different timing and time time zones changes how people react and what they're doing in that time of day whether they're being a mother in the morning or they're well supposed to be at work um, in the afternoon. Like th those are things that we see the different behaviors and that's kind of how we react. Um, but ultimately for our audience, specifically looking at contact in that time that they need something so we can kind of see that time in their life and that evolution. Yeah, I, I wonder what you think about this, Nathan, because I know you also have a very large uh, global audience. Do you see a difference in behaviors? Specifically, Sarah, you touched on the legal issue. So um, one of the, you know, we've seen a lot of change over the last 12 months. We did this conference in real life last year, one year on, everything's uh, like closer to the deadline. 
and coming closer into focus. And one of the issues is the, the regulatory changes that we've seen around the world. Um, in Europe, a lot of publishers have adopted ID5 in order to be able to fulfill the requirements of GDPR and prove that they are. Um, but I'm wondering with you, Nathan, how, how do you see different audiences behaving? And, and also, you know, the different browsers, the impact of different browsers. Sure. Um, well, let me let me answer that in two questions, I guess. <laughs> so on the browser side, I mean, this is something that has become very apparent to us over the years um, that, you know, a significant decline in revenue year over year, depending on what browser it was. Mm. And we saw really dramatic changes when, you know, whenever the date was that Firefox decided to not, you know, allow third party cookies. And obviously Safari always kind of being its own thing. Um, you know, we we have on average 25% on non-cookie browsers, right? right? So that's a huge chunk that we need to monetize as best as we can. Um, the other thing I would mention here is that some of our inventory is very unique, right? So we work with in-game environments while users are playing a game on a desktop application, things like that, which are not your standard kind of regular browser. Uh, and that kind of forced us to be almost ahead of the curve in that sense for that particular environment. And that is now actually helping us on our regular web-based publishers. Um, like I said, I mentioned certain things that, you know, uh, data that we pass in at ad call level that isn't cookie based around games or how long they're playing or what they're doing, uh, you know, how good are they at the game, uh, the hardware they have, et cetera, et cetera. That really helps to kind of tailor messages and also monetize it well. So very important um, to factor that in. The other topic there on the browser side is we deal with a lot of educational publishers on the COPA side. And that is its own animal, obviously, from a regulatory perspective, but also at school and on those computers in, in schools, they might have a very different browser or network settings than a normal web-based publisher, right? So that's already something we've been accounting for. So that's kind of the browser side. Um, to get into the, the regulatory piece, Playwire, like I said, is always here to help the publisher. And we built a kind of very open architected system that can basically pick up any type of consent signal uh, the publisher may send us or any type of um, vendor the publisher is using. So we can pick up a third party CMP if it relates to GDPR, uh, we can pick up uh, CCPA signals, all that. We also have our own CMP if the publisher uh, would like to use it. We are part of the IB framework. They can use it if they want to. Uh, what we can do obviously is advise them on a legal basis of what they should be doing. That's really in the publisher's interest, but we are here to support whatever is best for their business and make sure they're not violating any terms. Yeah, support whatever best for their business and also support them in in keeping their own data private and keeping their Correct. user data private. And I think that's something, Jeff, that you um, would really advocate for as well. You know, there's beyond just the regulations, there's a need for greater privacy in the digital advertising industry. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, it almost seems to me that the irony is that the closer we move to privacy, the less private in certain ways we become. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what we'll end up with is an ecosystem that's much more performant than the one that we're, we're running in now. I don't, I don't look at this as being anywhere near settled. Um, I see some really smart ideas floating around the ecosystem and I'm excited to see how they settle out and to play a role in helping them settle out. So um, we'll see. What, what we do know is that from a identity perspective, the more we know about our readers, the better positioned we are to be able to make decisions going forward. So we're really, we're really moving into a massive push around um, asking our readers to create a value proposition for our readers that gives them an incentive to share with them, some, to share with us some of their PII so that we can then use it um, to drive identity solutions. Um, and I, I think there'll be many, not one, um, but I see, an, uh, again, an ecosystem that's beginning aimed to evolve around the idea that, that identity is the locus, that it's really the replacement for the cookie as we've known it today. Um, and that smart publishers who are like ourselves, not saying that we're smart, but smart publishers who in the situation that we're in that have been largely cookie-based, 
really have to get busy with the idea of um, finding a value prop around identity with the readers, else we don't have much of anything at all. It's a really challenging time. So how do you communicate that to your readers then? So we're starting to talk, so we're not talking to them about privacy at this point. Right. Um, that's probably a bridge too far, although at some point I think we will. What we're talking to our readers about today is the notion that um, if you'd like to have access to the greatest repository of high school sports scores in the state of New Jersey, you can find no better place than NJ.com. And when you come to NJ.com, which is the largest news and information website in the state of New Jersey, um, we would like to ask you to support the work we do. And we have a few different ways of doing that. One is just sign up for a newsletter. And when you do that, that gives us a starting point in terms of identity. Um, we prefer that you come to our sites as a registered user, register and, and gain access to incremental content, register and gain access um, to subscriber exclusive content that isn't available to a non-registered a non individual um, is an important, uh, important point. And then beyond that, what we really want to do is to cause the reader to monetize their relationship with us and give us PII. Um, if we can do that in a, in a thoughtful way, then we really begin to win in terms of positioning ourselves for what I think we see coming in the next uh, two or three years. So, so what, uh, when you say PII, can you clarify what you mean exactly? What are you asking them for? Um, effectively, one of two things, either an email address um, or a phone number. We can use both of those to help drive identity. Um, we're deep in the middle of implementing a customer data platform. And one of our sort of holy grails is to build our own audience graph um, that's as robust as an audience graph that Facebook or Google might have. I don't know that we'll get there anytime real soon, but uh, aspirationally, the idea of driving towards a more, um, a more customer aware state and having the customer be a little bit more aware about how we can help them is, uh, is critical. Okay, and so you'll be able to, um, well, you'll be able to have a better relationship and a better understanding of them for many reasons, including you can then add these hard signals, as we would call them, to the soft signals that we're seeing on the probabilistic side to improve, uh, to improve how you identify them and then pass that yep. onto the buy side. And I think that you've always been a pretty forward thinking publisher when it comes to programmatic advertising. So how is this received by the buy side and by your SSP partners? So I, I think they really like it. Um, <clears throat> I can't find anybody who thinks that the current cookie environment is, is working. Um, I don't know a lot of folks who would advocate for it as being a really effective um, kind of environment to um, trade advertising in exchange for revenue on. Um, again, the more you know, probabilistic is good, deterministic is better. Um, and the more we can build a really clear graph of our users, users across devices, across the content they consume, across the topics they're interested in, across the time of day they come to our site and what devices they come on, um, positions us to be a better partner on the buy side. And, and that's really been our goal from the very beginning is to be the best, the best sell side partner that we can to our buy side partners. And if we do that, then we unlock value um, for the content that we produce. That's been, that's been our mission all along. Not all publishers can command a login though. Um, Nathan, what is your thinking on that? Yeah, I think that's a really valid point. Um, you know, as of right now, I'm not too fond of this concept emerging of the email or the phone number being kind of the holy grail of future identity, right? I mean, um, it, it almost seems like a step backwards in a way and is gonna hurt I would say the smaller pubs more so than the walled gardens that already exist. We can get into that later, but you know, this is kind of uh, GDPR on steroids or so where I'm not just asked to check boxes. I, I consent to this and that use of my data. It's like, give me your email, you know, and it just doesn't seem right. It seems, uh, it just doesn't seem like the way forward, especially with all the privacy concerns in the market. Um, I haven't really seen many other solutions. I mean, that's why I think ID5 is good because you're trying a more probabilistic way of, of determining a user, um, but it remains to be seen. Now, I'm not saying not to collect emails or phone numbers if you can, 
but but to have that be this kind of in your face you know you want the content give me your email or so um it seems a little far-fetched and maybe going the wrong way uh and then, you know to the other topic about the walled gardens you know of course uh of course, if you want to use all the various Google applications or Facebook or what have you, you're going to pretty willingly give up your information because you want to use Google Maps as you're trying to find your grocery store or whatever. Uh, but if it's about, oh, I just want to re read a review of a game and I'm on a random site and like, oh, they want my email. Mm, I don't know. So it remains to be seen there. And I, I hope I hope there's going to be a good solution in the market that works for the whole web and not just kind of some big players too. Nathan, you make a really good point, right? So I don't think that out of our universe of readers that 100% of them will be interested in trading PII in exchange for access to content. You right. know, we look, at, we look at our readers in about three different buckets um, based on the level of intensity and the amount of content they consume. And the amount of content they consume is a proxy for how important the site is to them. So we know that for some set, set of readers that having a deterministic match based on a really compelling value exchange, which ultimately from our point of view results in a subscription is critical to sort of the life, the annuity revenue that drives our business forward over time. Um, we have another set of readers who are reasonably engaged. We think that they'll trade minimum PII in exchange for access to content, particularly when it's something that's compelling and personally relevant to them. And then there's a third group of members that we're never gonna find PII on, and that's okay. But uh, you know, in our case, about a third of our a third of our pages come from a fairly small subset of really, really engaged readers and making smart strategies to reach out to them is, is sort of everything we're going about, we're going on. Yeah, no, so, that, anyway, I just wanted to say that. No, that, that, that makes total sense. I mean, we, we have a couple of publishers that do have kind of login uh, functionalities. And mm -hmm. in some instances, again, if, if you're trying to download a desktop application to play a game, you're gonna have mm -hmm. to, you know, submit some kind of information. Uh, so yeah, totally get it. And I think that makes sense. We see the same, uh, the, the really, really engaged users, they're gonna be mm -hmm. the ones that are gonna be willing to, uh, you know, uh, sign up for something or in a newsletter and, and get more content from a publisher. Um, yes. I, I just yes, hope exactly. it doesn't, I just hope it doesn't go the, the GDPR way where it's you now this big box in your face. Hey, you want the content, give me your email. You know, I hope that's not where the industry is going to trend. I honestly, yeah, sure. I don't, I don't think it will just to like chime in from us. Like, I mean, our biggest concern, we don't have logins and we don't want to um, in the sense that like we have newsletters for sure, but like we're not, you know, like we want to help people in their time of need of that day. And we don't want it to cost for them to do that. And we don't want, we don't need their email for them to, for our sites to do its job, meaning them knowing how to take care of like their toddler isn't necessary for us to get their email or them guiding, you know, what type of car they should best buy for the family is not for the, you know, it's, it's evergreen content and helping people. And I totally agree. Putting your email out there for PII is the exact same. It's us going backwards or like going back in time. It's like we, the cookie's going away. So let's replace the cookie with an email. And then right. how many people are going to put in fake emails? Like, I mean, Yahoo email, the old Yahoo email, like would have a gold mine because it was all fake emails. Um, so I think that that's like, I don't think that that's the solution. I think that's the typical, including myself, ad tech way where we're like, oh, well, let's just do this thing. We know it works and it's simple. But, um, and to, you know, Jeff, to your point, like, you know, you have a, a small group of emails and stuff, but like, that's not gonna scale for um, publishers to make money. Like, you know, like, I, I mean, you see some of these guys, like the Merkles of the world and Axiom and so forth, and you get these data sets and it's like 140,000 in terms of targeting. It's like, I have a better idea. I have a better chance going to these people's houses and knocking on their door to give them what they want. Um, so I don't sure. think that that's the way that we're going. I think that it's a solution for, like, I feel like everything we do is kind of like, let's just figure out the short term. There's a short term solution, and a long term solution. And I think the short term solution for us is either figuring out an attribution model that is that makes sense for our, or, we, or makes sense for our marketers, but also doesn't interrupt our user experience. 
And then a long-term plan is like to your guys' point of like whether it's universal ID or like if it's um, you know some sort of adapter that's built into prebid that every publisher uses, like that could be something. Um, but I think that the biggest thing for us to think about is how do we let this scale for all publishers? Um, because also these agencies, like they can't work with hundred publishers and have a different measurement tool for each of them. Um, and then also like, how is it going to, you know, scale for us in the sense, like we're going to need this information too. Um, and I think every publisher to create a newsletter, to get e emails is not going to scale, um, the audiences that we want in order to be successful long-term. Yeah. yeah and I, don't, I would like I to add here too. Oh, or Jeff and then Nathan. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't. So I don't disagree with you at all. The one thing that I that I have observed over time is that the weirdest thing is that we can all call ourselves publishers, but every publisher has a very different sort of set of challenges facing them. And um, if I were in your shoes, I would I would think I would take your position. Um, you know, from where we sit as a publisher, we're trying to accomplish twin and sometimes conflicting goals of driving the largest scale programmatic revenue business that we can, the largest and uh, most comprehensive um, consumer revenue consumer monetization effort that we can. And the question is, where do we find intersections? Where do we find points where, where sets of common needs come together? We know that from a consumer revenue perspective, if we have PII, we have a five to 10 times greater chance of converting that, that reader into a subscriber. And as it works right now, we can use PII as a proxy for, for cookies within the ecosystem that we're playing in and achieve benefits there. Long term, you know, it seems to me a universal idea or using Prebit as a as a clearing hub for a multiplicity of identity solutions is really the smart end play. Um, I'm sort of obsessed with the middle piece piece right now because I'm living it every day. Um, but I like your longer term perspective. Yeah, and I totally agree. I mean, yeah, every publisher is a different for sure need. And I come from the New York Times, which is the opposite model of where I <laughs> am today. So like. I totally, not I totally understand, but I, I feel like I understand. My husband works at Business Insider, so I really live it. Like I, the subscription news model versus our model and what the need is. I think the biggest problem or the biggest like hurdle I've seen is like, we're still working with the same marketers, meaning like our clients are still the same um, across the board. So it's like, even though our needs are different and we think, our needs are different. We still have this very similar readers. Um, and we have very similar like goals in terms of like who our advertisers are and who we're working with. So I feel like to your point, like there's definitely differences in terms of content and how we are trying to like evolve past where we are today. But then there's also this point where it's like publishers. I mean, like the thing I always say, like we have to make money to be able to build this content. So like in order to do that, we need the marketers and we, you know, they need to have the like same share and the same goals that we do. Nathan, you had a comment there too. Yeah, I mean, what I wanted to add is that, you know, I've seen one thing that I like about this kind of coming demise of the cookies and third party data and whatnot. And it's kind of an odd one because it takes me back to the beginning of my ad tech career is that, you know, content is becoming more valuable like the environment where something is right and in a way it would make sense there was such a dash to just targeting audiences right like i want to reach someone that plays golf i don't care where they are they could be on a chess site or on a gaming site or whatever whereas really i mean the con the environment where the ad is impact its performance uh, for the advertiser, right? A, a gaming ad on a gaming website or a, a, or a trailer for a movie on a movie site is just much more effective than in a, in a completely displaced content, right? So, and I think it's, a, it almost went back to that, to the roots, if you will. And, and, and uh, in that way, I like that that's happening. <laughs> and then obviously also that it's it's opening up um, a lot of new avenues to kind of build smarter audiences than just about, hey, you went to this and that website and now you're in some kind of weird bucket, right? I, I mean, I often check myself, like, oh, what, what do people like Oracle think that I am? And sometimes I'm a 50 year old woman 
and then on the other one, I'm a, I'm a male or something. So it's, it doesn't, it's just kind of funny. There's nothing wrong with being a 50 year old woman. I do. I, <laughs> I like wearing multiple hats. I do. I have a son. So, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think you make a good point. If the audience can be completely out of context. Then Jeff has all this audience of people looking for cruises. Um, but at the same time, we're, we're faced with this common competitor with the wall gardens having so much data and so much information. So we need to find a way to make it easy for buyers to buy your audiences, all of your audiences in a way that they can, they can target, they can frequency cap and measure. Let me ask you, Sarah, what, what kind of measurement do your agencies and, and brands that you work with ask for you now? And, and, and what would you like to be able to give them in a dream world? I mean, in a dream world, you know, I could give them whatever they wanted. Um, but, I, you know, what they ask for essentially is, um, you know, I mean, you ask for the, the usual suspect things, right? Like cape, like CTR, viewability, um, like performance-based metrics. What we do, which is interesting, is we have an entire team of like data science and research analysts that really look at like who our readers are that are reading this stuff. Um, and that's how we, that's how we say, like, we're like, we know that this person is not on the site because they like want to just learn about 401ks. They're on our site because they're in Investopedia and they're looking specifically at what to do or like with what's going on in the world stimulus checks. Like they're looking at like, how do we make the most of those or things like that, those, those questions. So like we provide that research back to our clients sometimes what we'll do is we'll create a data segment based on what we have and then we'll use theirs and then we'll kind of compare and contrast and do an A to B test and be like, ours worked. Um, but that's not scalable for the future of when they're targeting on our open. And we saw it and I'm sure you guys hopefully saw it too. Otherwise I'm like a little nervous for us, but like Safari essentially like you get half the, you know, you get half the bang for your buck now. Um, so, which is great because in the sense that you can like overcharge for Chrome, but also it's like, we're missing this piece of our business. And I think one thing that has happened specifically in programmatic is like, we had this massive business and it would just like, it just flowed in, right? Like you would set up a header bidder partner and like, just let the money flow. And then slowly we had GDPR, which we were like, oh crap, that's policing it down a bit. And then we had this, and now we have the identity thing and it's just slowly slithers and from a growing and healthy business perspective is we don't, we need to grow up. So it's like, how do we essentially do that um, and not miss the mark of all the other stuff that's going on? Sorry, I just went in like another tangent part, but um, ultimately for our advertisers, we want them to be successful in, in the targeting world, but we also want them to be successful on the open. And if they're all paced back and their hands are tied behind their back because they've bought, all these agencies bought DMPs essentially, like IPG bought Axiom, WPB bought Epsilon, um, you know, um, Mercury M1 is Dentsu. So like, we have to just like figure it out with them because now they have different KPI goals that we have a harder time adhering to. I mean, I think one thing I would say there is that also I mentioned earlier that we work in the COPA space, so kids which is extremely restrictive, right? So, I mean, basically all you can do is frequency cap, right? And, you know, I think that really um, made us figure out how to derive value from that inventory, right? And, and with, with signals that aren't cookie based and that are still good for the users. And not only do you have to abide by all the rules out there, but you also have to make sure the ads are appropriate for the age range that it's on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we use things like, um, you know, we, we are uh, episodes that a kid's is, a kid is watching and we can kind of say, oh, well, that is for such and such age, or it's probably a boy or something like that. And then we can work with bigger brands out there and help them reach um, the desired audience they have. And also the performance metrics, you know, uh, explain different values of our performance that are beyond just click or viewable or something like that. We make interactive games for our publishers and our clients and things like that and really try to engage them and keep them on. And, you know, our advertisers seem to like that. I think you can definitely rely on the advertising technology and 
industry to uh, bring some innovation, especially when uh, the rubber hits the road, like the situation we're in now. Let me ask you all, where do you go to for advice on these kind of issues? Are you looking to pre-bid? Are you looking to the IAB? Who, who are you relying on to help you navigate these issues? Um, we really, I mean, we, I don't want to say we don't rely on anyone, but um, <laughs> that's silly. But um, I mean, we really rely, like, I think the biggest thing is like on our marketers, because they're the ones that kind of are shaping how we do our business. Um, you know, we look to the IB, we're, of course, but like, you can't, I think this is one of those things where you're all in it together. And it's good that like, publishers are meeting other publishers. I would say the biggest loss, I think in the past 10 months, which everyone's gonna, or six months, whatever, which everyone will probably mock me when I say like, I miss conferences and stuff. And I knew that maybe we had way too many of them and they were a little ridiculous, but it was a good way to like, see people that you weren't naturally reaching out to and like ask like what they're doing sort of thing. Um, and I think that's like a huge, um, you know, miss. But in terms of relying, I think we really just, for us at least, we, we talk to our, our publisher friends in the marketplace always. Um, and, you know, we just keep, we work with our data science team and internally to figure out like, what else can we do? Yeah, I kind of agree with that. I don't think there's uh, unfortunately a one source of truth you can go to at the moment. It yeah. feels like the ship is just kind of in the ocean floating around and everyone's you know trying to steer it somewhere. Um, but yeah, like pre-bid, IB, those are all great. But you know, obviously most of us publishers use the same ad server that's out there. So also heavily reliant on that company to uh, look forward and they are, but you never know what they're gonna do and it may or may not be in the best interest of an individual publisher. So it remains to be seen. All I see is everything I can find, I read everything I can read and then try and make sense of it from the point of view of our specific individual use case. You know, I'm fortunate that I don't have to boil the ocean and try and figure this thing out for everybody. The question is, can we figure out where this is going and be best positioned to take advantage of the twists and turns along the way is kind of my own strategy. Try and keep it simple, <laughs> you know, and not try and think too much at a certain point. Simple and scalable is what we like to say at Playwire. Yeah, same thing, right? Um, Throw a little bit of agile along the way. And, um, you know, we've been rolling with it for a long time now. And um, I don't see anything changing. It's just, it's getting a little bit faster. Yeah, so you mentioned time and you mentioned faster. And in the course of this conversation, we've talked about regulations, we've talked about multiple markets, we've talked about the limitations that we already knew about with the third party cookie, especially as that relates to data leakage for, for publishers and then also for, for the consumer data for your visitors and personal data. So obviously in January this year, as, as we've alluded to, uh, Google, on whom many of us are reliant, but Google announced that they plan to deprecate the third party cookie in Chrome. We do this conference every year. If we fast forward to this time next year, where do you think we'll be? Let's start with you, Jeff. Where will we be this time in 2021? I have no idea. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. Um, other than to say that the industry is built around the idea of bringing buyers to sell and sellers together in, I think the most amazing marketplace has ever existed in advertising and that we'll, we'll find our way. There'll be, I think so many different alternative sort of notions around how this works, um, how identity works, how targeting works, how attribution and frequency capping works um, that will be, we'll all find our answers and they'll probably be different for every publisher just just because we have different problems to solve for. Sarah? Um, I'm scared to say that we'll still be here, um, <laughs> but I think that we'll be in, maybe in person still here, um, the way that, you know, the, the things are happening um, and on the health front. Um, it sounds like that's part is good, but uh, in terms of like where we stand in ad tech, I think we'll still be in a similar spot. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that it's not, hasn't progressed in a year. It just means that like, it's, it's gonna take a really long time. And the, the good news, I guess, about that is you're right. Like we do rely heavily on Google and they have to help us 
kind of navigate this in some way, whether we want them to or not. Like they shut down tomorrow, we're all in trouble. So um, yeah, I, I can't really predict it, but I think there will be, <laughs> will be maybe a similar situation. And Nathan, I'll let you have the closing words. Where do you think we will be this time next year? What, what do you predict for 2021? Well, let me pull my crystal ball out and shake it around. But no, I think I think I agree with what the others said here is that, you know, I have this odd suspicion we'll be in a very similar boat and nothing is decided or defined yet. Um, I mean, if I think back to GDPR rollout, I mean, that was known it was coming for years. And I, I literally remember a day before the due date there, everyone was still scrambling to get stuff ready. And it probably took months after that to even have things in the market that worked. So, and that was way less fundamental than getting rid of a cookie, right? So uh, in a year, is the solution gonna be in place? I, I'm skeptical and I doubt it, but I'm sure we will have made some progress, or at least I hope, uh, uh, more so, more than just hearing uh, fancy words around flocks and other bird species. Um, so we'll, we'll remain to be seen, but we're obviously we'll keep a close eye on it and, you know, push forward for our publishers. That's all we can do. So we're all looking ahead to a very busy year next year. It sounds like it. Well, look, with that, I'd really like to thank you all. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise, your experience and the different perspectives that you all bring um, as different publishers. Thank you very much for participating with us in Identity 2021. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.